there for you to check out, including books that I will be speaking about shortly um, from our keynote speaker tonight, Robin D.G. Kelly. That Robin Kelly is with us uh, this weekend as a milestone many years in the making. <laughs> <laughs> Robin has been, uh, I'm one of the conference organizers going back a while, and Robin has been, you know, like that first name on our wish list year after year after year, but, um, you know, he's a very busy individual, uh, and it's been very hard to get on his dance card, and finally, Robin said, yep, I'm there, I'm coming, in the summer of 2020. <laughs> the conference that we canceled due to a global <laughs> pandemic. So, Robin, thank you for being here. <laughs> and this is the third event Robin has done today. I'm just always gonna point out. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Robin, for your generous support for Haymarket Books uh, throughout all these years. Um, we're honored to publish your work. Um, I'll just point out, if, if you don't already know, uh, Robin wrote a really brilliant contribution to this uh, book, um, Organized Labor and the Black Worker by Philip S. Foner. Robin also wrote the afterword to Robert Maynard and Leanne Simpson's brilliant book, Rehearsals for Living, unfortunately, which they're now talking about concurrently in another room. This is one of the many complications of the scheduling of the Socialism Conference. I wish we could be um, in both places at once. Uh, Robin also has written a brilliant chapter, a very moving chapter, in a book that we're publishing next month called Afterlives. Um, so check that out as well. Um, and uh, really, tonight is a very special occasion. And, and more ways than one. Uh, obviously, just Robin being here at, at the conference. But also, uh, this is his first live event and first book signing for the 20th anniversary edition of Freedom Dreams, which uh, we're so excited about. Um, this is a revised and expanded edition. It also includes a new forward by Haymarket Books author, the poet, Ajahn um, and so, very excited that we can have Robin here to discuss uh, the book. Um, I want to tell a little story, a little sidetrack. Um, and it has to do with uh, this author, uh, Manning Marable. Um, uh, uh, I was very fortunate to work with Manning Marable um, many years ago when I worked at a, a, another publishing house no longer even exists, called South End Press in Boston. And um, when I was there, I got to work with Manning on a couple of books, including publishing his book, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America. Uh, and then many years later, uh, Haymarket had the great privilege to publish a new edition of that brilliant classic foundational work, um, which is right here. And um, after Manning passed, uh, there was an inauguration at Columbia University of his uh, archive. And Robin was there, and, and I was lucky to be there at this event where Robin spoke. And Robin told this, just, this story that I've come back to many times in my life um, about the power of being a young person and going into a library. And, you know, and these were the days when, and I, this is very familiar to me, going through and discovering a certain category of the Dewey Decimal System. HX, does anyone remember HX? That was very important in my political formation. <laughs> and um, coming across a book by Manny Marable, and um, he'll tell a story that I can't tell as well. I'll, I'll leave it for him to tell about um, the uh, the, the confusion of thinking that Frederick Douglass was still alive, uh, you know, in, in the 20th century, but 21st century, but 20th century. But anyway, um, Robin talked about how reading Manning Marable's book set him on the course of becoming the person he is today. And I think all of us have had those experiences of that book, those books, 
Um, and I have to say, Robin, uh, that for me, one of those books was Hammer and Hoe. Um, it really was foundational in my political education and formation. And thinking about um, becoming, you know, a lifelong dedicated socialist. Um, and Freedom Dreams is one of those books. And for a generation of people, you are Robin who Manny Marable was to you. And, and I just want to recognize that and say how special that is and how much we appreciate you for that. <laughs> um, Robin, I also want to thank you. Uh, people may know we have the St. Martin Books live series. We've been doing these events during the pandemic uh, online. Um, and Robin has been a regular featured speaker, host, moderator, interlocutor, you know, reader. Um, and that's been such an important part of the political education uh, that we've all been going through over the last couple of years. Um, and um, I want to mention that starting in October, we're going to be, begin a monthly series uh, for at least four months. Uh, I think it's going to go longer, uh, but we plan the first four months of conversations with Robin around Freedom Dreams. October 20th, he's going to be in conversation with Audra Monet, November 17th with Kiang Yamada Taylor, December 15th with Samora Pinderhues, and January 19th with Eliza Kelly. So uh, please tune in for those. You can find out uh, about those events um, from either following Haymarket Books on YouTube or signing up on our mailing list or following us on Eventbrite. Any of those places will be, we'll be, we'll be spreading the word. Um, I also want to thank Robin for being the most generous person I know on the left, full stop. Um, and I work with a lot of people, um, and it's really extraordinary. Uh, I, I'm an early morning person. I get up, you know, 5.30, 6 a.m. on the East Coast, and I will send emails early in the morning, and I'm used to being that person who can send an email and, you know, safely think, oh, well, I'm up for everyone else. Robin on the West Coast will respond to my emails <laughs> five minutes later. So I don't know when the hell you sleep, but... Um, I appreciate that. As I mentioned, this is his third event today. He has not only written enough forwards and afterwards for other persons, other people's books that frankly we could publish a book of your forwards and afterwards. I think we should talk about that. But he has blurred enough books that I think we can publish a book of your blurbs, Rob. And I will say, I'm not going to mention any names, but unlike a number of people whose names shall not go mentioned, you actually read the books that you learn. <laughs> it's very clear from what you write that you read them. Um, and I think that's really important. You are a reader, and other people are seen in how you read their work. And, and that has meant so much to so many writers I know. And so I just want to thank you for that. So the bottom line is that Robin, D.G. Kelly is the hardest working person in socialism. Either that, or he has the secret power of ubiquity. I suspect it's both. So, whatever it is, please join me in welcoming Robin D.G. Kelly. Wow, it's like a memorial. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 was like the great that was the greatest introduction I've ever had in my life. I had some really good ones too, and I'm always saying, "Don't say, don't say anything." Um, and and it is it is true. There, there was a running joke that I've i you know learned more books than I've read, but actually, it, but but Anthony's right. I do read the books, and um, and my wife's always getting mad at me, which is like, why are you, you know why are you reading these books? Why are you reading these books? You know, you have work to do. You have your own work to do, and it's true. Um, but I have a little secret is that, you know, I started learning books as a way to avoid reviewing them, you know, <laughs> because you can, <laughs> it's like a conflict of interest, like, oh no, I've learned that, I can't, but, you know, 
so it's a little bit easier. But I have to say, you know, I, I, um, I have a lot of, my name's on a lot of Haymarket books because Haymarket produces the best books. I mean, it is the left. I mean, I, I came up in an age where, you know, um, and this is no disrespect to any other left press, but I grew up, you know, Versa was one of the first books, was the first publishers that, you know, Sid Lamell and I uh, published a book called Imagine Home. Um, and, but Haymarket has basically produced the scholarship, the, the, the thought for the 21st century. You could go to Haymarket to know everything you need to know, you know, and I'm, I'm amazed by how many amazing books. It's one thing to produce a lot. There's a lot of composers who've written a lot of songs and get royalties, but like Thelonious Monk wrote, you know, all his songs are great. And that's like what Haymarket said, all the books are great, you know, so I have to say it. Um, tell No Lies, Claim No Easy Victory, so I don't lie on, on those blurbs, just so you know. And the books that I didn't blur, it's not because, um, I don't think much of these people can ask me, so. <coughs> okay, <laughs> I almost got myself in trouble. <laughs> okay, well, let me, let me begin. First of all, I want to thank um, Anthony, you know, for putting me on these panels today. Um, uh, and for inviting me and, and, and being here with all of you. Um, I've met a lot of people since I've been here. I admit that I've been running back and forth, so some people, I say, I'll catch you later. And I promise I will catch you later at some point. Um, I want to also uh, just acknowledge how special it is to be at this particular meeting, uh, which is named after the work of my dear friend, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Uh, as she said many times, we've been friends since 1988. Um, that book, Imagine Home, is a product of a project that we were all involved in back in the day. Uh, and we go back, and like her keynote last night was, as always, brilliant, thought-provoking, inspiring. It compelled me to think more deeply about what I want to share this evening. Uh, kept me up all night thinking about it. Um, so I'm really super proud. <laughs> um, and the fact that this entire conference is built around her conjunction that we change everything, I actually want to dedicate my talk to Ruthie. Um, and hopefully it's up to her standards. No, it's not up to her standards, but you know, she would be kind of me. Um, so, I confess that I am sad that many of the folks, you know, as, as Anthony mentioned, who we all should be in conversation together, you know, our concurrent panels, uh, of course, the brilliant Bob Maynard and Leanne Bibba Sissamaki um, uh, uh, Simpson, and, you know, and they're talking about their kind of incredible, incredible book, Rehearsals for Living. Uh, which holds many of the ideas of socialism as living practice and how we fight and live and remake the world at the same time. And Joe Burns is talking about intensifying the class fight in the union movement right now, not to mention discussions going on about abolishing the family and changing the face of the U.S. empire. The eco-socialism panel uh, with Kate Aronoff, who, by the way, has a great piece in The New Republic about Jackson. And I would want to suggest that you look at that. Um, bringing awareness to this long-term ongoing crisis of capitalism. And, of course, uh, speaking of Jackson, Kali Akuno, uh, who is scheduled to speak at the same time, couldn't make it. He's out trying to raise money for Cooperation Jackson and other Jackson-based uh, social justice uh, organizations. So before I begin my talk, I just want to make a, a plea. Uh, if you can donate to Cooperation Jackson, please do that. Uh, if you um, uh, can you know, push your elected officials, including Biden, to basically support uh, the work that they're doing, um, call on Biden and your elected officials to advance their principal demands. If you have a car and you don't have anything to do, could drive down there and deliver water. Uh, if you can volunteer, if you have some construction skills, they're trying to build a new water catchment system um, and install solar panels. Uh, and you can contact them at uh, cooperationjackson at gmail. Dot com, uh, cooperationjackson at gmail.com, and you can also sign up at the DSA Afro-Socialist table. Okay, so let me also begin by acknowledging where we are. 
where we are, where we're at. Uh, we're in Chicago. Chicago has the largest, oldest, most violent urban gang in the country called the Chicago Police Department. <laughs> and I really mean that. It is a gang. <laughs> you know? um, so it's no accident that the same city has a most impressive radical history. I mean, that's what you have police for, in part, to suppress opposition. Uh, and Chicago makes socialists. I mean, this is a home of the socialists and anarchist movements. Of course, Haymarket Books is one, a part of that presence. Uh, this is a home of Lucy L. Dean Gonzalez Parsons, anarchist revolutionary, uh, the home of the John Reed Clubs, of Franklin and Brown, of Richard Wright, Gwendolyn Brooks, Charles White, Ishmael Flory, Claude Lightfoot, and the indefatigable Willie Mae Reed, uh, who was the Socialist Workers Party's uh, candidate for mayor of the city in 1975. This is the home of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union, the home of the Black Panther Party under the leadership of Fred Hampton, which I argue, and hear me very carefully, because I'll, I'll repeat it if I have to, is you know, I argue the Black Panther Party in Chicago was the most significant socialist organization in Chicago's history. Now think about what that means. I'm saying the Black Panther Party was the most significant socialist organi organization in Chicago's history, a city with a long history of socialist presence, okay? So we want to think about what that means in terms of revising our understanding of what socialism in Turtle Island looks like. Uh, okay, so this is, is here in this city where we launched the Black Radical Congress. And speaking of Manning Marable, um, I was part of this small group with the Manning and Barbara Ransby had organized uh, called Ida Web. A bunch of us, um, you know, um, and so that core group formed the Black Radical Congress, which was launched here in 1998. Uh, this is the home of the majority, the home of BYP 100, the home of We Charge Genocide, the home of Asada's Daughters, of Project Nia, of the Let Us Breathe Collective, right? The home of the Chicago Freedom School, the home of people like Barbara Ransby and Fatima Warner, also known as No Name, and Mariam Kaba, and I see, you know, Asha Ransby Sporn and Damon Williams, um, and many, many others. These are socialists. This is what socialism looks like in Chicago, right? That's what it looks like. So my point is not, not to disrespect Eugene Debs or Daniel DeLeon, but socialism has some other faces, other movements, other visions. And that's what I want to talk about today, because that is the chief argument, one of the chief arguments of Freedom Dreams. Um, the exact theme that, uh, that Anthony actually posed for me, this idea of, the, of Freedom Dreams and the Socialist Project, is something, ironically, I spoke about at the Left Forum in 2005. Um, and I only had 15 minutes because I was on a panel with the late, great Amiri Baraka. Um, yes, I'm a lucky person, I know. <laughs> I, I can look, I, I, I'm blessed. I got to hang out with these people. Um, and Baraka was a friend. Uh, and antagonist sometimes, as I'll mention. Um, anyway, I had 15 minutes, and I spoke mostly about prefigurative movements trying to establish the basis of socialism, the basis for socialism, outside the shadows of the state. And I compared some of the movements I wrote about in Freedom Dreams with what Peter Lamborn Wilson and Hakeem Bey had dubbed temporary autonomous zones. And, and these were popping up in Latin America. And by the way, this is beyond the scope of this talk, but those temporary autonomous zones become the foundation for some of the socialist movements that erupt in the various waves of the Bolivarian revolutions. In any case, these were spaces for prefiguring or modeling what they wanted to create. And I gave an example uh, kind of Turtle Island-based temporary autonomous zone where third world liberation, anti-racism, and radical feminism came together 
in the Brooklyn-based collective Sister to Sister. They not only challenge US militarism, neoliberalism, globalization, and gendered violence, but inspire new movements and new visions of socialist transformation whose origins were not necessarily Marxist-Leninist. That's not to say they were, they, they were not anti-Marxist, it's just that some, those origins emerged out of other things. Just as the Panthers began defending black people from the police, Sister to Sister began focusing on the nexus of gendered violence, both domestic, interpersonal violence, and state violence, visited upon vulnerable immigrant communities. And they expanded their work to create um, a solidarity economy. You know, they trained in childcare, in, you know, uh, other means of, to self-sustain their communities uh, around anti-capitalism, cooperation, and care. Now remember, after that session, um, Max Elbaum wrote me a very sweet laudatory note. Said, you know, really liked your talk, let's talk. And Baraka just kicked my ass. <laughs> he was on the panel and he was haranguing me. And if you know about Baraka's trajectory, it kind of makes sense. He was haranguing me about, you know, no, this is about taking state power. We need to take state power. And he wasn't entirely wrong, by the way. Uh, but what Freedom Dreams and the black radical tradition that informed the book was trying to do was it was a kind of effort to think beyond uh, the binary of state versus non-state, which is not the same as leaving the state behind altogether. And this is a debate that we may end up having uh, about where the state is, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, because there's a tendency to say, you know, no state and reject the state. And then there's another one saying, well, bring the state back. But I think that binary gets in the way of some other things I want to talk about. So too often when we talk about socialism, we either discuss it in terms of socialist states, uh, you know, what they can deliver that capitalist states cannot. And again, when I say when we talk about socialism, part of it is when we proselytize about socialism, when, we, when we're trying to recruit people, you know. Um, and of course, you know, there's other ways to talk about that. I, I, should, I should call out, you know, my friend and comrade, uh, Antonia Lee uh, in Left Roots, because they have a way to talk about socialism that is so damn sophisticated, and they bring people in, that they're doing work that a lot of us wish we can do in terms of really building a sense of what socialism requires, what it can be, how transformative, without being romantic. So thank you, Antonia, and thank you, Left Roots. Give Left Roots some money. And we talk about socialism in terms of sometimes the failure of socialist states to deliver on promises, you know, the, the critique of socialist states upholding democracy, et cetera. Or sometimes socialism gets framed through the lens of consumption and not production. So, you know, I know, you know, I'm old enough to remember how many times in my in the last 35 years I got uh, the anti-social skeptics will say, will I lose my house? Can I still have Nikes? <laughs> you know? And in those conversations, rarely does the problem of food security, clean water, livable wages, shelter, the lack of health care, education, or enduring the violence and militarism for the people who make the Nikes come up, mm -hmm. uh -huh. right? So this is really important. We talk about socialism. Even in our privileged life, even a privileged working class, we've got to think about what the world is dealing with. Um, so the result of this kind of discourse of trying to win people over to socialism has led to um, a slew of popular books, and that is through the state. That is the idea that, you know, if we have a social state, these are the things you get. And it's led to this slew of popular books out here, which I describe as socialism without socialists, right? Now, Freedom Dreams is not that book. <laughs> I argue that social movements are the incubators of ideas about freedom, liberation, socialism. Uh, it is more about movements to create the new world than describing in abstract terms what the world would look like. Although, we love that exercise. I love it. But that's not really what 
uh, the books about, nor is it something that we just do on our own. We do together in collective. Um, the book is fundamentally about socialism, the different paths movement people have imagined it might take to get there, for example. And in fact, in the original preface, I wrote about feeling alienated from the same old protest politics. Um, and I asked the question, what had happened to the dream of liberation that brought many of us to radical movements in the first place? What had happened to socialism the way we imagined it? What had happened to our new Eden, our dreams of building a new society? And what had happened to hope and love in our politics? And I should say, this is something I wrote um, 2001. And that's where, where, what I was thinking at the time. So just to be clear, um, in the book, and some of you have read read it before, you know, socialism uh, and wasn't just relegated to the chapters that focused on Marxism uh, or socialism or communism or those parties. Rather, each chapter, every chapter in that book ultimately had a kind of socialist dream behind it, every chapter. So whether it was the black search for self-determination and autonomy, a movement for third world liberation, surrealism, uh, black radical feminism or reparations. Every single one of those chapters had behind it a socialist dream. And in Freedom Dreams, I also describe the vision of socialism as compelling if incomplete. And of course, we all know in a general sense uh, what made socialist movements and parties incomplete. Uh, and there's many, many specific senses, but one general sense is the persistence of white working class racism of heteropatriarchal ideology. Uh, the assumption that the European proletariat was the working class and therefore the universal subject of class struggle. And, and Ruthie talked about this in our, our conversation this afternoon, um, that most Marxists are not, don't even look like that <laughs> in the world. The long history of socialism of the first and second international uh, entails their failure to make anti-racism central to its platform and its inability to be truly internationalist. No, I didn't say third international because it's more complicated than that because they actually did try to make racism or anti-racism a central feature. The latter point though about not being truly internationalist, and when I say truly internationalist, internationalism doesn't, isn't Europe and North America, <laughs> right? Keep in mind that you're talking about internationalism of the second international in colonizing countries. And that's not to say there were not socialists who were like deeply anti-colonial, that's true, some were. But many of those parties were not. And, and I think this is what we talk about internationalism. So this latter point about being truly internationalist um, deserves a little bit of elaboration because we tend to, to name nationalism as the problem. Uh, so the U.S. and European left embraced a certain, uh, certain nationalisms in the name of internationalism and rejected others because, you know, you read 19th century, early 20th century writings, some of those cats believe that, the, that there were real historical nations and non-historical nations. Engels said this, you know, I'm not making it up, read it. Um, that there's non-historical nations and they're, they're destined to wither away. Uh, what, what they often missed, though, was, and I'm, I may get myself in trouble for this, but I really want you to follow me because I'm trying to make a, I'm trying to thread a very careful needle here. Um, not all nationalisms were the same, okay? Yes, the second international succumbed to nationalist ideology when workers lined up to support their ruling class in World, World War I. You know, Italy was kind of an exception. Um, Yes, nationalism tragically birthed European fascism as a mass movement. And internationalism was the foil against it. Internationalism was what brought people to Spain, right? Internationalism was the foil against the, the nationalism that produced fascism. Um, and 
what's interesting, and remember what happens after World War II, even during World War II, is that that internationalism was defeated by the very Western capitalist nations declaring war on fascism. Because those cats who went to, to Spain to fight, where did they end up? They end up in front of House American Activities Committee, they end up in jails, they end up you know, all over the globe. Now, at the same time, as Cedric Robinson points out in Black Marxism, the anti-capitalist and anti-colonial struggles that often embraced socialist politics were nationalists, organized in the name of national liberation. Vijay Prashad talks about this, he calls it the Third World Project. You know? uh, some of these moments had corollaries in this country, which I write about in Freedom Dreams, uh, the Revolutionary Action Movement, the Provisional Government for the Republic of New Africa, uh, or in the collectives and movements that were uh, not necessarily nationalists, but they were black or third world. You know, they were not exclusionary, but they were trying to build power around specific issues to their community. So the Combahee River Collective, for example, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and by the way, if you go back and really study the nationalism of those movements, they were incredibly inclusionary. You know, it's like, you fighting for the black nation? Do you know how many white folks went to prison fighting for the black nation? Like Susan Rosenberg? I mean, I, you could go down the list. We, we forget that some of the white radicals of the 60s and 70s who went to prison, they were actually supporting the Black Liberation Army or the Panthers, you know, or, you know, um, uh, anti anti clan movement and these kinds of things, Freedom Road. They were fighting for black liberation. So these were openings. In any case, all of these movements identified themselves as socialists or promoting socialism, but they did not accept the conceit that uh, socialism was born solely out of the contradictions of capitalist society. Okay, so follow me here. This plays into the kind of Marxist stadial theory of history. Stadial meaning that there's stages in history. Uh, and that treats as a logical succession capitalism, then socialism, then communism. Like you've gotten that, you know, like you start with capitalism and even the, the belief that every nation has to go through a bourgeois democratic revolution and then you build the productive forces and then after that you can sort of seize state power, create a social state and eventually the state will wither away. And one of the limitations of this 19th century Marxist framework is that it conflated the emergence of socialism with the appearance of the modern bourgeoisie in the proletariat. But again, to go back to Cedric, uh, he says this in Black Marxism, but he also says it in a book called An Anthropology of Marxism. He writes, socialist thought did not begin with or depend on the existence of capitalism as Marx, Engels, and Kautsky, and later Marxists have dictated. But historical materialism demanded that for a socialistic mode of production, capitalism had to be prior. Thus, any expression of socialist principles prior to the maturation of the capitalist system was primitive or utopian. And of course, you know, I don't know anyone who's read Marx more carefully than Cedric, by the way, you know, just for all the haters out there. Um, and what he's also referencing is the fact that, you know, by the time Lenin comes on the scene, uh, he and others are thinking, okay, well, you know what? Forget about stages for now. If we can get socialism, we'll get socialism. And that was a, a kind of radical break. But anyway, to go back to Cedric, he maps the origins of European socialism back to the fourth century, to the Baptists, to the Christian socialists. Uh, in other words, he's saying socialism predated capitalism by a long way because the origins of socialism we're not in the mode of production, but in morality, in an ethic, right? I see Reverend Fort, you know, and knows about that, right? In an ethic. And so um, he, he goes on to say, you know, as a consequence, and this is me talking, this is not him, but so as a consequence, we have been bequeathed an impoverished and limited notion of what socialism or a post-capitalist society might be. And I'm not suggesting we return to the ancient Christian socialists because their problems too in terms of what was happening in the fourth century, but rather socialist visions 
need not always refer back to Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, etc. In order for us to have a, a kind of blueprint or vision of socialism. This is one of the limits of Engels' famous essay, Socialism Ut Utopian or Scientific. So if there is a socialist project today, it requires changing how we think, how we relate to one another, how we relate to the land, how we relate to science, right? Yes, the concept of science is critical. In principle, you know, like I'm all for that, um, you know, against disinformation, science, science, science is good, science and superstitions, Science is against old tradition bound structures of patriarchy, um, it, although science upholds patriarchy. But we should remain skeptical of Western science as a product of enlightenment rationality, the ideological seeds for the cultivation of capitalism, imperialism, and settler colonialism. You know, all the, the, the economists on the eighth floor of Bunch Hall at UCLA, they believe in science. And what they talk about is just bullshit. Right? And that's supposed to be science. You know, they're running reg data, regressions and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> so why is this important? It's important partly because one of the lessons I think Freedom Dreams offers or tries to offer is that the socialist project isn't just about changing material conditions. It is a spiritual and ethical project. It has to be. It is a psychological cultural and, dare I say, civilizational project in the sense that we need to create a new kind of civil society. And let me give you a concrete example. I mean, a lot of us on the left love the climate change argument for socialism because what it does, it restores a particular kind of universalism right, that the left has relied upon. And that is, now we've all made this argument, that you know, we have to save the planet Climate catastrophe is a great unifier. Just like they said, COVID's a great unifier, right? Because we all experience COVID. And you know, there's a logic to that. Yes, socialism could actually, is the answer to trying to reverse the damage of climate change possibly. And I'm all for that, I love it. I'm not against it. Don't, don't tweet that <laughs> Professor, that Robin Kelly says, you know, that we, he doesn't like the climate change. I love the climate change argument. However, my concern is I don't think existential threats and material conditions alone, alone should be the basis for socialism. We've got to step it up. So an obvious one is to go back to the climate catastrophe. It's, it's, you know, it's certainly capitalism's doing, we know that. Uh, and it is gendered and it is racial capitalism that situates us differently to the toxic environment and destruction wrought by the system. And so if we say stop worrying about racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, you know, ageism, ableism, if you just say we're gonna stop doing that and defend uh, the earth, and once the earth, then we'll all be able to live together, then we don't actually deal with the differential relationship because some of us are dying faster and sooner under the climate catastrophe than others. And that's something we have to attend to. And again, this is not just the United States. I'm talking about the whole planet. If you're talking about the planet, we're talking about the whole world. Um, another thing, just, you know, we're, we're a room full of abolitionists. Eliminating cages isn't just about saving money, but it's also about ending torture and violence. Ending racism isn't something you do only through the law or affirmative action. It is about confronting trauma. It is about education and reparations and repair. And clearly there is much you could read about this, but I would point you to to start with Derricka Purnell's Becoming Abolitionist, you know, which really takes you through a personal journey but also a collective journey to understand that to be abolitionist is not simply about removing these structures and not even just about replacing it with something else. It's about lived experience and the damage that capitalism, racial capitalism has done to us and how do we heal 
And what does that entail? Okay? So let us pause for a moment. And since I did mention reparations, uh, I want to talk about the attack on the demand for reparations coming from a segment of the left. Um, some of those cats look like me. Uh, in the name of defeating race reductionism. Now, reparations is regarded in this discourse as a hustle. Okay, now, let me be fair. It is becoming a hustle. <laughs> let's, let's be clear about that. In some circles, in the hands of the black bourgeoisie, it is, and its allies, reparations is becoming the latest hustle. Let me explain what I mean by that, and let me explain what I tried to do. Uh, namely, in its popular liberal expression in the US, uh, reparations, the way it's being kind of mapped out, does not change the terms of racial capitalism at all, nor does it acknowledge land theft and native dispossession as part of the same process of settler colonial extraction that depended on the theft of human beings. The logic of liberal reparations is firmly rooted in property rights, right? It's rooted in documentation. If you don't have a subscription to Ancestry.com, don't even bring your papers up there, <laughs> right? Don't use someone else's subscription. Um, and it's, it's, it's rooted in, in compensation without transformation, that is, without addressing uh, indigenous dispossession, for example. Proposals in this framework tend to think about or frame reparations entirely within a capitalist political economy. So payments are calculated according to capitalist principles. Outcomes are even seen as strengthening capitalism, making it more fair and less racist so that we can actually continue with the non-racial capitalism. That's part of the argument, which is hilarious when you think about it. Um, creating an even playing field so we can compete together. And the case for reparations has become increasingly parochial, driven by the demands of the Eidos people, the American descendants of slavery. For example, this is book uh, uh, by Bill Darity and uh, Kirsten Mullen, who Bill Darity is a great economist, uh, an amazing figure. I just disagree with the book, which is called From Here to, to Equality which not only argues that reparations should be limited to U.S. descendants of the enslaved who can document their genealogy, but they dismiss Asian Americans, for example, whom they deem voluntary uh, immigrants who directly benefited from the U.S. Jim Crow regime. Now, let me just give some history here. It's kind of an odd hi, hi. <laughs> um, it's an odd and ahistorical assertion because it betrays an ignorance of a long history of forced Asian labor, which of course replaced a formal chattel slavery. The first thing they did was they got so-called coolie labor, contract labor, um, throughout the Western Hemisphere. And also, it, 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 it ignores the ways in which US wars in Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, produced refugees, right? So mainly, this plan for reparations not only strengthens capitalism, but maintains class relations and class power, and actually does nothing to address contemporary racism. It does nothing to stop organized abandonment. It does nothing to end mass incarceration and all forms of unfree labor and disposability, and it does not restore or expand the social wage or address the conditions that render some people vulnerable to all sorts of violence. However, the way I wrote about reparations and freedom dreams, you know, actually operated on socialist principles. And let me make a plug for Femi Taiwo's book, Reconsidering Reparations, which makes a similar argument with even more nuance and detail than, than I did. But reparations, you know, in that chapter uh, in Freedom Dreams, was supposed to, f was imagined to fund revolutionary movements not put money in pockets of individuals, but they're like $10 million for the National Welfare Rights Movement <laughs> as reparations, $20 million for African liberation movements, you know, um, $20 million for a, a black college, which says a lot about what they thought of black colleges <laughs> um, at the time. So, you know, when you think about it, you have the Black Workers Congress, the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, and INCOBRA and the like, 
What they wanted to do was bring down the U.S. empire. That was the point of reparations. It was about social justice, reconstructing our lives as a people, ending all forms of racism and exploitation, and creating a new nation. This is why reparations proposals from black radical movements focus not on individual payments, but securing funds to build black institutions, and in some cases, establish a homeland. And they imagine new economic arrangements geared toward collective needs rather than accumulation. So as I wrote in Freedom Dreams two decades ago, uh, reparations has the potential to radically transform society, redistributing wealth, creating a democratic and caring public culture, exposing the ways capitalism and slavery produce massive inequality. It helps us all understand how wealth and poverty are made under capitalism, particularly a capitalism shaped immeasurably by slavery and racism. It stresses the fact that labor, not CEOs, not scientists and technicians, not the magic of the so-called free market, creates wealth. It ought to compel us to pay attention to the centrality of racism in the US political economy, because one of the consequences of racial differentials in income and economic opportunity is downward pressure on wages for all working people. Um, and then I also add, just very quickly, it should make us look at gender and consider women's unpaid labor, reproduction, sexual abuse, and ways to make restitution for these distinctive forms of exploitation. The last thing I want to talk about um, is, and this is not as organized, but socialism uh, and so the socialist project and the vulnerability to state violence um, and states violence, more than one state. This is important because um, much of what falls under the socialist project is not like the neat state Take, of, take, take over of state power. And then like you take power, then you implement socialist policies. Um, e even the Russian Revolution, which came the closest to that, didn't quite work out that way. Um, and in fact, trying to build socialist alternatives as they go, you know, both within and outside the state, um, is one of the challenges. And so when I talk about I began talking about temporary autonomous zones. Well, these zones are always um, fragile, always vulnerable to invasion. And I want to really emphasize this because actual movements, when you, in other words, if you shift from socialism to socialists, you're talking about people making movements and engaging in practice, which leads them to being vulnerable to repression. So early 20th century jails and graves and ships deporting people are full of socialists, just so you know. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, in today's jails, they're full of socialists, but we don't see them that way because they were Panthers, New Africans, American Indian Movement, Puerto Rican Independence, Weathermen. You're hard pressed to find any of these folks in those movements fighting for capitalism. Right now, Existing socialists face repression. There's much to celebrate about the left in Chile and Colombia. Of course, both you know, have socialist leadership winning by slim electoral margins. In the case of Colombia, under Gustavo Petro and uh, Francia, uh, uh, Francia Marquez Mina, they not only don't have a parliamentary mandate to introduce the kind of radical changes that we wish they can, but Petro built a coalition that included elements of the capitalist class, the Pacto, Pacto Historico, the, 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 the oligarchy that's still driving Colombia's economy. And uh, Francia Marquez Mina, to be clear, she's on the left of Petro. Like she, she doesn't agree with all those positions. And we're going to see what happens next, because she was opposed to some of the compromises that were made. And in Chile today, as you know, Right now, there's a vote going on, a plebiscite, about whether or not to adopt the Constitution. So under um, Gabriel Boric, there's this plebiscite. As you know, the Constitution was already approved in 2020 with 78% of the vote uh, two years ago. Now it's an imposed mandatory voting, forcing everyone to cast a ballot. And it's not clear it's going to prevail. 
Uh, and it's an extraordinary document, by the way. If you ever have time to read it, it's like 388 um, uh, sections. And it, it recognizes indigenous sovereignty. It guarantees social wage and a robust welfare state. Uh, guarantees free medical care, free higher education, grants rights to the natural world, full gender inclusivity, including gender parity in government, um, recognition of LGBTQ uh, two-spirit peoples um, as fully included, uh, gives uh, popular institutions greater power. But right now it's under assault by a massive corporate uh, propaganda campaign that is saying that what's in that constitution uh, is things like, you know, your home is going to be expropriated. <laughs> Once again, we're going to take your house. They're, they're putting out myths about abortions will be allowed at nine months. Pension monies will be taken by the state. The future of Chile is going to look like Venezuela and Cuba and all this other stuff. So even if, it do, even if the, um, the plebiscite succeeds and the Constitution is approved, we have to defend the revolution. We have to defend the regime vigilantly because we know what happened next year is the 50th anniversary of the U.S. overthrow of Allende um, and, his, and his murder. So we have to begin with actual socialist movements. And one last thing I want to share before I do one last reading, and that is um, if you follow the news, talk about state repression, you would know that on July 29th, 2022, the FBI orchestrated a pre-dawn raid on the headquarters of the African People's Socialist Party. And we should all be upset about that. In St. Petersburg, the broader Uhuru uh, Solidarity Center on the south side of St. Louis, in the North St. Louis home of its leader, Chairman Omalia Shatila, uh, and Deputy Chair uh, Ona Zenej Yeshatila, they brought an army. This is the Biden-Harris or the Harris Biden, I don't know how you want to look at it. I mean, she's the cop. They, but they brought an army, armed tactical gear, battering rams. Oh, Ch Chairman is like 80 years old, right? Flashbang, grenades, assault rifles, drones. They were detained, placed in handcuffs, and had their cell phones, computers seized, as well as file cabinets filled with financial records and archives. The African People's Socialist Party has been around for literally half a century. And they're saying that, you know, that the Russians told them to demand self-determination. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a big thing. Like, you, you've been involved, you, you, you want a, a state, you want self-determination. You know, the Russians told you that, so therefore you're enemy number one. Um, and they're persistently anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, while at the same time creating their own solidarity economy. Um, they have a bakery, they have housing. They're trying to do something different. Um, Russia and China are used as justification for this new domestic Cold War attacks on socialists. And I know the DSA is bigger now than probably ever. Um, but watch out, they're coming for you. You got to be prepared, you know? If they don't come from you, for you, you be, should be worried. <laughs> I know they're coming for, for the Afro-socialists, trust me because they always do. <laughs> Think about that. Um, so imagine when liberal multiculturalism, right? So, so what, you know, what does it mean to talk about socialism in this age of, of reactionary anti-wokeness, -woke, right? So liberal multiculturalism becomes the latest leftist enemy, right? Um, okay, so... Finally, there's Jackson, Mississippi, which I don't need to talk about because we've been paying attention there. But again, that's a city uh, whose leadership was a product of years of organizing people's assemblies. The Republic of New Africa's presence there in 19, beginning really 1971, 72. Um, and they built this, this um, form of governance which whatever divisions are existing in Jackson right now, they're dealing with a hostile state. And if you know the story, it's the state government that has been denying the city of Jackson revenue that's supposed to go to them. And there's a whole long story, but my point is that it's not enough to build what we dream of. You've got to defend it. Even when you win power, 
even when you are elected official, I mean, because um, Chokwe Anta and Chokwe Lumumba's dad, they were elected to office, right? And they still have to defend it. So let me just end by, with a reading of a passage from the new epilogue of the new edition, which replaces the original. Um, and I, so basically what I did was I restored an original epilogue, which I had scrapped uh, from the book in the, in the wake of 9-11, and it was this wild piece of speculative fiction that imagines a century-long revolution led by maroon poets and, la and launched the, you know, the following, launch, following the protests against the exoneration of the police who killed Amadou Diallo. And I'm not reading that, but what I want to do is just read little, one passage that, of the section that comes after that. Uh, and it's called Poetarian, Poetarian Revolution is Here. And it opens up a longer discussion about Jackson, Mississippi, and Detroit, and against a repressive state neoliberal governance. So, um, so I, so imagine you just heard the story, and I'm right. This is what revolution looks like. It begins with what Fred Moten and Stefano Harney call fugitive planning. It is woven from the spontaneous revolts of poets who set the world in motion with their words, their bodies, their songs their art. Revolutions are not singular events, but long dreams shared by aggrieved communities, nurtured in fugitive spaces, and enacted by social movements. Even in dark times, revolutions are nourished in liberated zones, the spaces we create where we can grow our souls, as Gracie Boggs aptly put it. This is what true revolutions are about, she wrote. They're about redefining our relationships with one another to the earth and to the world, about creating a new society in the spaces and in the places and spaces left vacant by the disintegration of the old and about, about hope, not despair, about saying yes to life and no to war, about finding the courage to love and care for the peoples of the world as we love and care for our own families. And that's Grace Lee Boggs. So what Grace proposes is no dream. The maroon poets, which I write about, in liberated zones are everywhere, hiding in plain sight, turning image into deed, turning poetry into action. We've already seen many examples of real life MPs, artists turning freedom dreams from noun to verb in the introduction to this volume. Um, Aj Monet and her crew are the original maroon poets. The poem in action, the defenders of the dream who understood freedom to mean everything Freedom to imagine, freedom from police, prisons, and poverty, freedom of movement, freedom of mind, freedom to be. And those are Aja's words. The scholar, activist, and poet Alexis Pauline Gums offered one of the clearest articulations of what it means to create liberated zones in which abolition is practiced, where the world we want is constantly in rehearsal, built on memories, experiences, and an ethic of care. These practices become the freedom seeds for a different future. She asked, quote, what if abolition is something that sprouts out of the wet places in our eyes, the broken places in our skin, the waiting places in our palms, the tremble holding in my mouth when I turn to you? What if abolition is something that grows? What if ab abolishing the prison, industrial complex, is the fruit of our diligent gardening, building and deepening of a movement to respond to the violence of the state and the violence in our communities with sustainable, transformative love, question mark. Image becomes deed. Detroit, like Jackson, is becoming a liberated zone where poets and solutionaries of every generation are unafraid to build what they haven't seen or fight a system that has wrecked, uh, wreaked havoc on the land, in our lives for five centuries. They understand that freedom dreaming is not a luxury or a fantasy, and that our very survival depends on turning dreams of decolonization, redistribution, reparation, and abolition into action. Long before COVID-19 inspired writer, critic, and revolutionary Arundhati Roy to famously describe the pandemic as, quote, a portal, a gateway between one world and the next, Detroit's and Jackson's Freedom Dreamers 
had been digging their own portal to the next world, not waiting for a crisis or opportunity to seize the moment. They haven't stopped digging, right? So last two sentences, socialism means to keep digging, right? And think about digging in multiple ways. Keep digging, both the portal and the trenches. It requires, to quote one of the greatest living intellectuals, sustain creative aggression. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, can we have a round of applause for our ASL interpreters? I mean, uh, so we do have some time for um, questions and comments. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a three minute limit, but you know, brevity is the soul of wit. If you can speak for one minute or 30 seconds, that'll mean a couple more people can participate in this conversation. And you don't have to just ask a question, you know, if you have a comment, observation, you're welcome to share it. Uh, I want to remind people that Robin, after this uh, session, will be going to the Haymarket Books Room and signing the, f the few remaining copies of his books that have not been sold this weekend. But uh, if you have already gotten one uh, or you want to just talk to Robin, he'll be in the Haymarket Books room after. Um, and uh, among the books we have are not only uh, the two that I mentioned, Hammer and Ho, and the new edition of Freedom Dreams, which you just read so beautifully from Robin. Uh, but also, you know, Robin has written the authoritative uh, biography of Thelonious Monk. So among his many other talents, we could also talk about his uh, relationships with uh, the history of jazz and his connections with so many amazing musicians. Um, one of whom, Sam Samora Pinderhues, will be part of that uh, dialogue series I mentioned um, coming up this fall on Haymarket Live. So I, I just ask two people at a time to come up and then we'll give Robin a, a chance to come in um, so I'm going to do multiple rounds of hand raising. I apologize, but I'm just going to do two people at a time. So if you want to throw up your hands, I will uh, recognize you by some item of clothing or other uh, right here in the black shirt. You can be first. Anyone else? Yes, right there. You can be second. And then we'll do another round. So could you come to the mic because we are live streaming and we are recording and that way everyone can hear what you have to say, comrades. Hi, sorry, I'm, I'm a little dizzy from your speech. Um, um, so thank you. Um, um, Robin, I wanted to ask you about um, this balance between um, solidarity work and support and also criticism. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess I've been grappling this for, like, for years. I started my, my kind of entry into socialist politics was doing Cuban solidarity work and fighting the embargo against Cuba. Mm -hmm. So I think it's still really important. And um, coming across a lot of, um, you know, and this is also for like international socialist movements and then, um, and then the critiques of like authoritarianism and should we be supporting this country or that country, this party or that or this movement based on critiques of authoritarianism and, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, especially with your, your piece about defending socialism and mm -hmm. defending those regimes, how you would, how you, I guess, grapple with support and then also, you know, understanding criticism or the role of cr critique and also knowing our place, like where right. it's coming from, which is the West, you know? Right, so, right, right, right. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. But well, it makes perfect, it's okay. an excellent question. Thank you. Should I, should I take another one? Or just Maybe one more. Okay. Let me, I, I, um. My question is nowhere near as beautiful as that. Um, <laughs> So, so I just want to um, first. I, I just want to say thank you. I think um, between the conversation I was at earlier 
um, Ms. Prunell's conversation, Ashley um, Henderson's, mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, Ruth um, Gilmore's and yours, I think I'm slowly leaning to being okay with identifying as a socialist. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at Chris who, who works for me. Um, but, I, but, it, but, but all seriousness, I said it and I came here when Chris, so Chris Harris is, um, is my colleague, coworker, whatever. Um, and and he is, um, he's the reason we're here. Because again, for the people that's been hearing me speak over the last week, um, socialist and and black in Texas has been a very weird mix. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think um, and just to be honest, in my experience, white people have um, all but turned me off from anything socialist. Um, so I'm here and I'm seeing my people speak, um, and I've, I've heard about you before, and then. Just to hear you speak, and, and um, again, you know, Ruth Gilmore last night was just, um, I mean, of course though, right? So um, I, I guess the question I have for you is a couple of things. I mean, again, I'm posing this to the room because part of this is like knowing that you don't have the answers, it's part of a collective struggle, right? Um, it's like, I think we still need to do more, like we need to have these type of conversations, collectives, Converses in places like Texas, Louisiana, Alabama. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, I, I, I don't know why that person is screaming so loud, but I, I hope it's um, because they agree with this statement that I'm about to say. It's because like I, I agree with even the, the 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 tagline "Black Radical Imagination," but from being in a place like Texas, um, and I can I can also I'm gonna project a little bit. I know I'm wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, that I, it's harder for people to have the imagination and all these other things when your very existence is in survival mode. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and, and that's why I think these conversations are so much needed in the South where even in Texas right now, people don't have fucking ACs in prisons. Mm -hmm. This shouldn't exist. Right, right. Um, where, where we talk about borders, early we talk about borders, but in Texas, we had fucking babies wrapped in full sheets um, because of, you know, every administration, not just Trump, mm -hmm. but also right, this right. one. Um, you, you know, like, even when the Haitians were seeking refugees, they just miraculously disappeared in, like, two days. So it's just like, until we respect the South, and also until we understand that as the, grow, so, as the South grows, so does the nation, mm -hmm. um, I feel like we're leaving so many people left behind. So I, I don't know if it was a question in there, but you can take it, do it now. Okay, it's, it's Chaz, right? Chaz. Yeah, no, because we ran into each other. I promise you I will sign your book. Remember, I, I said that. And in fact, um, you, you um, no, what you, and I'm, I'm going to get to both questions, but this, I'm going to take yours first because it's really, really important for lots of different reasons. I'm so glad you called out the great Ashley Henderson, who's right over there. Um, and the work she has done with, with Highlander, and you know, and one of the things that Ashley knows um, that some of us know, but I don't think anyone knows better, is that the South is the most radical place in this country. You know, and that's we don't always get that. I remember um, after the after Trump's election, I had all these colleagues at UCLA talking about, oh, we got to do something about the South. And I wrote something actually in the, in Boston Review saying, you know, you all sleeping on the South. I said the reason why it's so repressive is because it's the most radical place. That's why the the, the regime of punishment, the regime of violence, the fact that you have states like Alabama and Texas passing changing their state constitutions because they can't win any other way. They can't win any other I mean, let, let's remember that um, we talked about, I was talking about New Deal earlier today, that in the 1930s, you know, we talk about fascism, and people say, oh, don't use the F word, don't use the F word, you know. But in the night, you know, before the 1960s, and, and to this day, but especially before the 1960s, the South was bona fide fascists, and I could prove it. You could prove it because it was a one-party state, right? It would deny the right to vote. 
It put corralled people, used violence to control people. Um, and all those senators and congressmen ran all the committees because they had the most seniority. So, they, so in, in the reason that there was no anti-lynching law in the United States was because Roosevelt and all the people, all the presidents after that, were like, well, we, you know, the, the seven senators are more powerful, and we do what they say. And so um, black people and all the people, including the poor white people, came up under fascism in the South. Mm -hmm. That's true, and it continues. But it's a place where you find the most vibrant, most militant oppositional movements. And it's where, you know, I chose to write about the South where socialism was most vibrant. And that's the place. So I'm with you. We have to have these conversations. We also have to re rethink our history. Like, like, remember that, you know, when we talk about Juneteenth, for example, there's all this mythology around Juneteenth as if somehow, like, Black people didn't know that slavery was over. And then here come the union. And it's just not true. The fact is that you know, Galveston was in union hands who was defeated by the Confederates in 1863. And then they got it back. Black people, of course they knew. You know? Of course they knew. That's, that's, and, and more importantly, um, if you look at the traditions of struggle within Texas itself, you know, Galveston was a working class city with a strong union, and black workers led white workers on the docks. They were the leaders of the labor movement in Galveston after Juneteenth, right? Um, and, so June, and, and so the fact that Juneteenth was called by, by our people Jubilee, that means a lot. Biblically, it means it's, it's a time where the bottom rail is at the top. It's the time when you forgive all debts. It's a time when you, you, know, you basically secure freedom for the most downtrodden and hold it. And you recognize whose land it really is, right? So I'm with you on that. We have to have these conversations. And we have to stop thinking of the South as the backward place and think of it more as the vanguard, you know, because that's where it's been. So we have much more to talk about, about there. And, and, and one last thing in terms of what you said. Yes, there, my experience is that the folks who have almost nothing are trying to eke their own, eke a way to live each day are often the ones thinking hardest about how to get from point A to, to point Z as opposed to point B. In other words, you know, it's, it just, it's not an accident that some of the folks who, who sort of presented us the, the, the black radical imagination are not necessarily the intellectuals, not the ones with have written books or doctorates. Part of what Cedric Robinson writes about in black Marxism is that these great intellectuals, Richard Wright, W.B. Du Bois, and C.L.R. James, did not understand the black radical tradition until they studied revolutions and all the nameless people who engaged in this general strike during Reconstruction, who engaged in the Haitian Revolution, who, you know, fought, who were basically the peasantry of the South, that they're the ones that demonstrated to them what the black radical tradition looked like. And what they learned was that its roots are not necessarily either in the contradictions of capital or in um, the Western Enlightenment but they're actually rooted in much older things that African people have carried with us, and we still carry with us, you know? So these are the things we have to study and understand. Um, on the question of, of criticism, this is a very important, this is a critical question because um, as I began with, uh, socialist regimes are not perfect, and there's no reason to be silent on our criticism. In fact, we have to be critical all the time. Um, and in, and I, I got myself in a little trouble. I, I, I um, recently co-edited uh, Walter Rodney's amazing lectures on the Russian Revolution. And in, you know, in writing the introduction, had to deal with even Rodney's um, inability to be critical of certain aspects of Stalinism when he was critical of others, and why it's important to understand why he took the position he took. Um, so, on the one hand, we do have to be critical of socialist regimes, openly, honestly, forthrightly. 
At the same time, and this I learned from my friend Vijay Prashad, you can still be critical and defend the right of self-determination of socialist regimes. You know, so, and also be really, really careful about what we study and what we know. Because you know, so much of the writing on the failures of the Soviet Union were not written by people inside the Soviet Union. They're written by people who have an interest in trying to destroy the Soviet Union. That's not a defense of it. That's simply saying, where does the ideas come from? Right now, there's a war in China. You know? And much of what we are told about how terrible things are, and there's some things that are terrible. Ch China's not, I would argue China's not a socialist state. It is state capitalist. You know, just like the Soviet Union became state capitalist. You know? And that's true. But that doesn't mean that, OK, so therefore, as a leftist, let's support the US military state to wage war in China. Really? It should be unacceptable. It should be unacceptable. So I'm just saying we have to be critical both of other regimes. We have to be critical of our movements and critical of each other in a way that's loving. Because if you really do criticism well, the most loving thing you can do is to critique. And the reason why I say that is because you don't critique to make someone feel bad. You don't critique to make yourself feel good. You don't critique to prove to everyone in the room that you know so much. You critique because our life depends on getting the right answers. You know? So. Just quickly, I want to mention, um, for those of you interested in the conversation about organizing the South, there's a very important conference coming up, the Highlander Homecoming, A New World Coming, September 30th, October 2nd, in Tennessee, highlandercenter.org. You can find out more about that or talk to Ashley Woodard Henderson about that. And I also want to mention Ashley is working on a book that's forthcoming in the Abolitionist Paper Series from Haymarket Books. So hang out, <laughs> stay tuned for that. And if you also want to talk about organizing the South, and if you haven't read it yet, you've got to read Hammer and Ho, just another, another reference uh, for that. OK, I think we've got time for two more uh, comrades right there, um, and then right there. Yeah. Wow. Um, so my name is Jawanz, I use he, him pronouns, and thank you so much. Deeply, deeply respect and appreciate you. I'm here with the Black Youth Project 100 as a board member, but I'm also a member and a founding member of the Afro-Socialist Caucus and um, Social Secular Caucus of the DSA. Mm -hmm. um, but my question, um, I want to bring in to the conversation Olofemi Taiwo's mm -hmm. um, Reconsidering Reparations, which is in the re most recent book that I've read, right. and you mentioned him earlier, and obviously you were in the panel, and I watched an like, uh, interview you did with him about the book yes. um, recently. Um, I just, I'm hoping that you're able to offer to the people in this space some of the profound um, you know, concepts from the book about reparations and just mentioning some of the most important parts to you. Um, I'm really trying to encourage people at this conference to really think about the revolutionary socialist reality of reparations mm -hmm. and how it is critical for us to really be able to engage in that conversation. Because I think that if we're not actually having a conversation about that, then are we really contending with the realities of racial right. capitalism right. and the global racial empire, as Olofemi calls it? And I also want to uplift what Chad has been saying. I'm also from Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm from Beaumont, Texas, 80 miles southeast of Houston, um, just on the Gulf Coast, you know, a 30-minute drive from Lake Charles, mm -hmm. Louisiana, um, though today I live in Brooklyn, New York. So just a question about reconsidering reparations, about the socialist case for reparations, and the importance for us to talk about that. OK, got it. Hello, um, yes. my name is Brian Young Jr. Uh, they, them. Um, I'm here with the Hollywood Collective. I'm also have worked with the Defund CPD campaign mm -hmm. for Black Lives. Um, and I, I just more so have a comment. I want to thank you so much, Robin, for just what all you've done. Like I'm, uh, I've, I've listened to you speak, and I'm just um, so excited to get like dive into your books. But um, just on a general point, like. I think why I appreciate you so much, like one, just your existence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank thank you. you so much uh, for just continuing to contribute to the black radical tradition and just your work on racial capitalism. 
and just like you being like a black socialist in this space is just so uplifting um, to me as a black socialist who is gonna continue to do this work. But also I want to just uh, thank you again for con continuously calling in our black radical ancestors mm -hmm. um, because, you know, um, I forget your name. You came up and you- Oh, Chaz. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Um, like I celebrated the idea of someone coming into socialism or coming into the practice that we can't control our future as the majority um, because a lot of times, like when I was coming into socialism, uh, a lot of what I saw, if I were dependent on just like the mainstream media, a mainstream just sort of like books or a lot of the canon, I would think I would have thought that socialism was just this white thing. Mm -hmm. But when I started to actually dive deeper, like I saw like uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, I saw Lorraine Hansberry, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, a Chicagoan, right? Away from the sun. I saw um, Claudia Jones, and Claudia Jones has a good book. That's like, right. You know, That's right. like right now, um, The Left of the Marks, uh, Thomas Sankara, The Black Panther Party, The Kambahi River Collective, like Freedom Magazine, like all these different, like, just sort of like, you know, uh, uh, oh, CLR James in the writing about the Haitian right. Revolution. Wow. And, um, and so I'm just so excited about this just on a, just on a point of just like re representation because I stand here as a black, non-binary, um, pansexual, polyamorous socialist. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of the tradition. I just appreciate you being here because I don't know, like I wouldn't have been a socialist if it wasn't for Franz Fanon. And mm -hmm. so like, I just thank you so much for just existing. Right. <laughs> well, I gotta begin, I gotta begin with, with what you said, Brian, because you have to understand, and those people who know me um, uh, know that it's like y'all are my breath. I mean, my breath. I am so fortunate to see the work that you all do. Um, and I've said it more than once, I said that, that, that this generation of radicals, I wouldn't call them socialists, because some people will claim the term, some people will not. Um, I think it's the greatest generation, much greater than mine. And when I say that, it's because it's like, the, and I say this in, the, in you, you could get the new, the, the new version of Freedom Drive, I pretty, pretty much say this. Um, it, there's a way in which you all are out there in the streets, fighting, 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 coming back, uh, which is why I'm always naming these organizations, uh, thinking, 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 fighting, fighting, finding ways to talk to one another that's not based on, as we talked about earlier, the old democratic centralism. That is to say that you struggle with each other to come up with ways to respect one another and respect the world you're trying to build, which is not necessarily how we came up as, as Marxists. We came up beating people up, you know, um, not physically, but in a way that was really emotional. Uh, and we didn't love each other. You know, all the things that when you all repeat um, Asada Shakur and say it over and over again, we didn't say that in my day, you know? So I think, you know, in, in, in a city like Chicago, where, you know, I, I mentioned Asha, I mentioned Damon, I mentioned a lot of people I know who are here, I might, might not see you, who literally, literally helped bring down um, this torture machine in Chicago. I mean, brought it down. It, it doesn't mean that the police are gone because there's still work to be done, but the way, the bravery, the courage, right? The militancy, the refusal, the radicalness is something that I, I've never written about that because it hasn't happened. I'm trying to write about it now because you're all making it. So don't, so don't thank me. I mean, I'm, th I'm just thankful for your existence because that's how we keep going, you know? So I appreciate that. And which is kind of tied to the, your question too and also the work that you're doing. Um, you know, on the, the, the socialist case for reparations, you know, I will never succeed in winning the argument because there's such um, 
inertia around reparations from a certain segment of the left. Um, and I don't really understand it, but I, but I, I no, that's I take it back. I do understand it because of the ways in which, as I mentioned in my talk, reparations could easily be co-opted and become something else. Um, but for that matter, that goes for everything. Yes. Socialism, yes. you know, there's lots of things that happened in the name of socialism that were about capital accumulation and about violence. And so, so part of what you're suggesting or asking, and I think what Femi's book tries to do is to think about what is the revolutionary uh, uh, reparations project or program. And all I can say is that, you know, like read Femi's book, he makes a, a sophisticated argument, and part of that argument has to do with uh, reparations both as a source of education, of, of rethinking the way we understand how the world operates, uh, reparations as a massive ca capital transfer. You know, um, one of the things that's possible with, with reparations, and keep in mind, reparations is a global phenomenon, and it's not just reduced. Most reparations campaigns are not even about slavery. It's about things like, you know, state violence. You know, we have campaigns, campaigns in Colombia, the Afro-Colombian community demanding reparations for years of genocide. You know, um, there's reparations in Guatemala, re reparations um, for the war in, wars in Iraq. So there's a lot to, to repair. Um, but I think it's important that if we're going to make a revolutionary case for re reparations, we can't make it solely about money. It is about, re it's about A, redistributing wealth, B, recognizing uh, the relationship between one class's wealth and the violence visited upon all kinds of other people. Um, it is about trying to repair relationships, not to make friends between ruling classes and the oppressed, but to eliminate the ruling class. That's the point. We don't need a ruling class. Um, and, and, I, and I would make the suggestion, because I still think it's one of the most extraordinary documents ever written, is to look at the Black Manifesto, which is the, the, um, the Black Workers' Congress and um, the Black Economic Development Council, they, they put together this document. And they weren't asking for that much money. I think it was like $3 million at some point. And they went to churches, churches and synagogues. You know, they wouldn't even go to the state. But my point about that document is that just like Ruthie, Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about the budget is a, a kind of, is a moral document. The reparations, the, um, the Black Manifesto is a moral document. They're saying, we, we want to reach distribution of wealth for these purposes. And nowhere does it say, and everyone get a Mercedes, you know? <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says, we want to use this money to rebuild and fight to, they want to give money to movements to fight back and to eventually um, overthrow uh, a vicious ruling class and create something new for the future. So, you know, I think, and I want to say all that because I, I just want us to make sure that we don't have a knee-jerk defense of reparations as if all reparations proposals and plans are good. I think one of the, I mean, this is just me. Don't get mad at me. One of the dumbest things I've ever seen, um, but I think it's, I call it performance art. I don't think it's an actual, is the idea that you find a white person to venue, Venmo you some money. <laughs> and that's reparations. Now, I'm all for, if this white people want to Venmo black people money, that's great. That's not, that's not the point. But if you say that substitutes for reparations, what you're saying is that you're telling somebody you can feel better, you can have your conscience clear if you just Venmo $300 every month to such and such a person, and they could, you know, they could buy their weed, they could, you know, get their house, they could do whatever it is they want to do, that's not reparations. Reparations is remaking our relationship to the class, you know? And one last thing I'll say about this is that one of the, one of the critiques of, rep, of the reparations proposals that are about um, and by the way, Queen Mother Moore, um, who was, who her reparations program, she was like $500 trillion, 
you know, she wasn't playing. <laughs> and, and she was mad because people said, well, you know, you don't, black people don't need reparations, it's got all these welfare payments. And she's like, what? You know? But if you think about even Queen Mother Moore, part of what reparations payments in terms of supporting communities would do is that everyone who lives in those communities that are victims of organized abandonment would have an effusion of, of capital, an effusion of resources, all the things you're supposed to have. And if you're not black and you live in that community, you benefit from that. And to me, that's perfectly okay. That's great, because chances are the people living in those communities, if it's not being gentrified, are not there because they wanna be. <laughs> They're there because the system has put them in a precarious situation where they're living with a whole lot of black poor people and brown poor people. And so if other people benefit from, or if the health system, for example, benefits from infusions of capital, then everyone should benefit and that's okay. You know? um, and finally, uh, when uh, Femi talks about reconsidering reparations, he's also thinking globally. And we have to think about this always globally. It cannot be limited to the nation state. And this is the frustration with the Eidos people. They literally are gonna tell uh, uh, people of African descent who are from the Caribbean, from Latin America, from Canada. <laughs> like you don't get reparations because you can't prove you're a North American slave. As if slavery worked that way. <laughs> it's even worked that way. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Please join me in once again thanking Robin for being here, for his work, for his writing.